the book of Genesis, all right? The book of Genesis, chapter 12, Genesis chapter 12 in the Bible, amen. Praise God, praise the Lord, and find verse 7, Genesis chapter 12, and then look down and find verse 7, amen. Praise God, praise the Lord, amen. Stand if you like to in the honor of reading God's Word. They did this when Ezra had read the Word of God in the Old Testament. I preached on that one time. Never since then, people took that and they, uh, by faith and said, we're going to stand in the honor of God's reading His Word as well. Chapter 12, verse 7 of Genesis. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed going on still toward the south. I, I want to minister on this thought, this topic here this morning. Abraham was a dad too. I want to talk about Abraham was a dad too. We don't think about that too much, but he was, wasn't he? He was a dad. And he had sons and he had a family. He was a father. Not only the father of our faith, but he was a dad. He was a father to his family. And so I want to talk about Abraham was a dad too. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be able to minister thy word. Very thankful for our dads, our fathers, God, that helped raise us. They're important. They're precious in your sight. I thank you for the purpose and the call on each of their lives and each of our lives. I pray, God, your blessing that uh, our hearts would be attentive, God, that we would not let anything hold us back from your presence or receiving of thy word today. I love you, Father. I pray your blessing, your anointing, your unction as I minister thy word. And may you be glorified. And I pray in Jesus' name, amen and amen. And you may be seated. Praise God. Praise the name of the Lord. I want to talk about that Abraham was a dad too. And all, of course, we have all heard messages, I'm sure, preached through the many years about Abraham. We know that Abraham is the father of our faith. And, and through the years, we have taught and preached on Abraham as a man of God, a man of faith, which without a doubt he was. And God had called Abraham out of his own home, the town of Ur of the Chaldees. And Abraham would follow that call, although he did not know where he was going. He was doing his best to follow God by faith. And I would say that there are a lot of good people that are saved and they love the Lord who are just trying to do the best that they can to follow God. Do I have a witness with that? Just trying to do the best that you can to follow God. Some of these people have jobs and families, children and responsibilities, ministries and careers and so forth. They too, just like Abraham, are trying their best to be obedient to God and to learn and understand who God is and what God's plan is for each of their lives. See, God intended to have a man who would know and serve him with a devoted faith. And from this man would come a family who would know uh, and teach and keep the ways of God. And this is what God wants today as well. Genesis in chapter 18 and verse 19 says, For I have known him in order that he may command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of the Lord. And this was essential in the calling of Abraham. It was God's purpose that Abraham would be a spiritual leader in his home. Now I want that to sink in to our men that are here today or those that are watching via the the camera or the video on Facebook. It's God's purpose that Abraham Abraham would be a spiritual leader in his home and that he would teach his own children the ways of God. See, with the call of Abraham, God established the father as the one responsible responsible to train his children and to keep the ways of the Lord, to raise up a family and a people that would do right and walk righteously before a holy God, that God would have his own special people that would have a heart that was after God. And this ought to be the heart of every parent today, of every dad, every father, every mom and mother as well. Grandparents also 
also, I will include that as well. It is a huge responsibility to train and to teach our children up in the ways of the Lord. As Proverbs 22 and 6, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. And it is difficult, I understand, because there is so much these days that are coming against children, that are coming against the home, coming against Christian marriages, coming against families, families at home, families in the church, everywhere you turn around, there is an all right assault, an attack from hell itself against children and teenagers and families and moms and dads and homes and churches today. There is an all right assault and we have to recognize the day and the time and what is going on and be sober and awake and vigilant to the attacks of the enemy. Now, one of the reasons this nation suffers in the degree that it does today is because fathers have not fulfilled the God-given call upon their lives. The men of this church have been going through a great Bible study dealing with these issues right here that we're talking about today. The breakdown in the world and in society is because of the breakdown in the home. It said that most men that are in prison and locked up behind bars have not only lacked a man to protect and to guide them, but had also suffered under the negative impact of men. In other words, dads not being dad. It takes more than it to being a dad than just birthing a child in this world. Or dads not raising their children up properly. Or dads not being responsible in taking care of their families. It is said that roughly 70% of all prisoners come from fatherless homes. Approximately 80% of all rapists come from fatherless homes as well. Fatherless homes produce 70% of all high school dropouts and 63% of all teen suicide because of a father that was not home, that did not be a dad, that did not raise their children up in the ways of the Lord, that were not there when their children needed them. Get this, on an average, the taxpayer spends more than $8 billion a year on high school dropouts for public assistance programs like food stamps. High school dropouts also earn an average of $260,000 less in their lifetime than graduates. In a 30-year period, that is over $8,600 and some odd dollars per year less. This reduces our nation's earned taxable income by more than three. dollars hundred billion dollars annually. Teen pregnancies cost American uh, uh, teen uh, pregnancies cost American taxpayers an average of ten billion dollars a year in public assistance, uh, lost revenue, and health care costs. Our prison population has increased by 708% since 1972 to the highest per capita rate in the world. We now spend one of every $15 on prisons. What we're missing today are men who will be men. Men who will be men of faith and men of God. Men who will be spiritual leaders in the home and in the church. Men who will take the God-given responsibility and raise their families in the Lord. Ezekiel 22 and 30 says this, So I sought for a man among them. Who would make a wall and stand in the gap? God is looking for somebody that will make a wall to protect and stand in the gap. Before me on behalf of the land. That I should not destroy it, but I found no one. But I found no one. In the book of Ezekiel we read that God released His judgment on a culture that was devoid of strong male leadership. Because no one would stand up and obey God. Therefore, he allowed the people of Judah to go their own way, to choose their own idols. No man stood up before the people to lead them in the ways of God. And eventually, God brought destruction to the nation. I'm sure there were a lot of men around, but not men that would rise up to the occasion and be men of God. Not men that would lead a nation and a people and their families in the ways of the Lord. And therefore, a whole nation and people suffered Be 
because of it. And folks, we are suffering today. I drove the church bus last Wednesday. If Brother Tim doesn't get back, I'm going to call on Brother Don this Wednesday. Amen. A little pressure there. Amen. I drove the church bus last Wednesday with Matthew to pick up kids for our children's ministry. And folks, my heart was broken. I challenge you to ride with one of our buses on a Wednesday night and see the condition of these kids and what they're living in. The spiritual depravity affects a person in every way. We don't have to go to a third world country to see the condition that they're living in. We have it right here. We have a rich house here and a very poor, unlivable house right across the street from that. It is right here. The same thing that I would witness and see in third world countries. Kids are suffering mental illness today like never before. The world thinks that giving them a pill is the answer. Some of us sit here and we're unmoved. We don't care. We're daydreaming. Our minds are wandering. We're looking around to see what everybody else is doing. The world thinks that giving them a pill is an answer. Kids are committing suicide on a daily basis because of spiritual depravity in the home. Teen pregnancies are an issue. Child abuse, verbal abuse, sexual abuse. We, as the teachers and leaders in our children's ministries, Deal with this kind of thing and topic with these children. I call parents and I have to talk to them. I just read that a man held his stepdaughter captive for 19 years since she was 11 years old. She's 30 now. She had nine babies from her stepfather. Repulsive. Evil. Demonic. Demented, nauseating, disgusting. But this is the world we live in and a little pill isn't going to fix it. No, my beloved, can I tell you, can I tell everybody watching today by the video, can I tell the world that it is not a pill problem, it is a sin problem. Somebody hear me today. It is a sin problem. And until we have godly men that will take responsibility and be loving and godly leaders in their home, it's not going to get any better. Your wife, your girlfriend should be way more than a sex symbol. And women, you should not allow yourselves to be sex symbols. Women all want to run around and say that they're being assaulted and sexual assault and all this kind of thing. Well, on the billboard, put some clothes on. You don't want to hear this today. Put some clothes on. I see the innocence of children being stripped away from them. Satan has put his mark on society. He's saying that they are mine. He's the prince of the power of the air. He owns the airwaves. It's a wicked time. Homosexuality and perversion are common talk. These kids are going around not knowing what they are. It is common talk when they come here on Wednesday night. Whether they say they're homosexual, I'm gay, I'm homosexual, I'm gay. There are a lot of, there, there are a, there, there are boys uh, one day and then there are girls the next day. New York State says the doctor can leave out the, on the birth certificate if the child is a male or a female now. So they can decide later what they want to be. There is a perverted spirit that is sweeping our nation. Men will be lovers of themselves. Men leaving the natural use of a woman. Burned in their lust for one another. Men with men committing what is shameful. Boys dressing up in feminine clothing now. Having difficulty finding their identity. And all of this is because of the spiritual breakdown in the home. Godly men and godly leaders are hard to find these days. Not churchgoers. Godly men and godly leaders. 
Here we are in a day and a time and a society that has what is called Gay Pride Month. Get this. Gay Pride Month. Marching around in nudity. Marching around in repulsive and demonic acts of evil. Debauchery and corruption with a reprobate mind. They are turned over. I don't care how wonderful they look on the outside. Living in a day of spiritual Sodom and Gomorrah and the cheap the church sleeps like nothing is going on shame on the church today i'm sorry if that sounds condemning if you can't handle it turn it off The only answer to the sin-sick problem is Jesus Christ. We know that God loves all people, but He hates their sin and He hates their wickedness. Now listen, my beloved, let me make this very clear, unless this might make it to the Senate or to Washington or to whoever listens. We are not a people of hate, but we are a people of love. But we cannot tolerate sin because God does not tolerate sin. He desires for all people to repent and be saved that's why Jesus died on the cross but because I don't accept the homosexual lifestyle doesn't mean that I hate people because I don't I will not and cannot accept what God will not accept but we love you enough to tell you that it doesn't have to stay that way amen let me make it very clear to you in case you're here today in case you're listening today in case you're watching today my beloved you were not born that way God did not create you that way God wants to bring you out of bondage and out of darkness to set you free and to give you eternal life and then you can experience what real love is because the Bible says that God is love and you have to know that God loves you church give us men like Abraham that have have the faith to believe God, walk with God, trust God that will be the priest of their home and a godly leader of righteousness. You see, you moms that are here and you're raising your children by yourself or even if you're grandparents and you're raising your children by yourself or your grandchildren, I want to encourage you today to lead your children by example. Teach them the ways of God. Don't be one way in the church and another way at home. Show them them and teach them and lead them and God will bless you and God will empower you and God will help you by His grace. Amen. You see Deuteronomy 6 and 6 and these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise up. It is a way of life. It's not something you do just on Sunday morning or Sunday night but it's in your home you talk of God you read the scriptures you pray together you lead by example you raise your children up in the ways of God because if you won't raise them up in God somebody or something will raise them up in hell something will raise them up in the powers of darkness because Satan is trying to steal and to kill and to destroy and to destroy children today amen just like they did when Pharaoh killed children in the Old Testament just like Herod in the New Testament, Satan is trying to destroy and kill children today. Look at what happened in the book of Judges and Judges 2 and chapter 2 verse 10 through 13. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation, another generation of kids, another generation of people arose after them who did not know the Lord, didn't know God, nor the work which he had done for Israel. And then the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. They didn't know God. Nobody told them. They served Baals. They forsook the Lord God of their fathers. They they forsook church, God, His word, His ways. They didn't want to sing the songs. And they followed other gods. They created new kind of churches and a new kind of gospel, a new kind of way, a new kind of music, a new kind of format in a sense. And followed their other gods from among the gods of the people. And they bowed down to them. And they forsook the Lord and served Baal and Ashtoreth. These people didn't know God. They're serving Baal. They're serving Ashtoreth. But they did not know God. There are people in church. They don't know God. Singing songs, but do not know God. It says they served Baal and Ashtoreth. Baal was a fertility god. 
which included prostitution and immorality. This nation today is engulfed in problems of immorality and prostitution, incest, rape. Asterisk was the god of war. Our kids have declared war on one another. Kids are killing kids, blowing themselves up on schools, public places, talking them into committing suicide. It's completely out of control. Many movies are from the pit of hell today, whether you agree with me or not. Video games that glorify death, murder, bloodshed, destruction. It teaches them that there's no value for life. Abortion, it's okay to murder children up to nine months old. That is murder. It's murder. It's murder no matter how old. If they're in the womb, it's life. It's a person. It's a baby that is growing. It's murder. The sad thing is the world is producing so many things and marketing these things for the mighty dollar, destroying our nation. They're blind to this fact. Satan is behind it. It's sad to see, but it didn't get this way overnight. Progressively, slowly, it's come to this. I believe in many cases it has come by example. Our example can have either a positive influence or a negative influence. But the best influence, my beloved, is a godly influence. From Abraham would come a family who would know the ways of God. And from this family would come a chosen nation of people who would be distinct from other nations. They would be carriers of of the revelation of the blessing of God. From this nation would come the promised offspring of the woman, which would be Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. In the New Testament, Galatians chapter 3 and verse 8, and the Scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles, that's you and I by faith, preach the gospel to Abraham before, saying, In you all the nations shall be blessed. Folks, I'm going to say the blessing is Jesus Christ. If you have the Lord in your heart, then you are a blessed people today. Folks, this world is a mess, but your world doesn't have to be that way. And although we see a deluge of evil all around us, you can make a difference in your home. See, God has called you. God has chosen you. So rise up, O man of God. Rise up and be the spiritual leader that God has called you to be. You can make a difference. And although we have a society that doesn't know who they are, amen, you can know who you are in Christ. And we can raise our families up in the Lord who will find their identity in Christ. Men in the home being godly men, making all the difference. See, what I'm saying here today is, men, God is depending on you. Your wife is depending on you. Your children are depending on you. Your church is depending on you. Your God is depending on you. People might ask, what's wrong with this world? Beloved, it all goes back to the events recorded in the book of Genesis. Except for the accounts in chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis, The first 11 chapters record one failure of man after another. Failures that bring repeated destruction like today. The first man and woman, Adam and Eve, disobeyed God when they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil when God told them not to. And they were kicked out of the Garden of Eden, chapter 3 of Genesis. Cain murdered his brother and Abel. Uh, Cain murdered his brother Abel and lied about it. Genesis chapter 4. And by the way, he murdered his brother before they had guns. So gun control isn't going to stop a murder. This is what the socialists want you to believe. It's a sin issue. It's a heart issue. The human race began, became so corrupt that God cleansed the earth with a flood. Genesis 6 through 8. Noah got so drunk, he exposed himself to his son Ham. Genesis 9. In their defiance of God, men built a city and a tower, and God had to send confusion to end their rebellion. Genesis 10. And what we see in the first 11 chapters of Genesis is disobedience, murder, deception, Drunkenness, nudity, rebellion. Sounds like the day we're living in right now. See, what are we going to do? What's the answer? Well, it starts right here. It starts right now. It starts in the home. It starts with men rising up to be the spiritual leader and example that God intends for us to be. God called Abraham to follow him. And God is calling us also to follow him. 
Quit making excuses. Put away the needle. Put away the bottle. Put away the profanity. Put away the game. And let's get serious about this. Notice some things about Abraham. I've got four points here today. Number one, notice that he was not perfect. Notice that Abraham was not perfect. Sometimes we get the impression that Abraham was perfect and that he never made mistakes. That is just not true. The Bible says that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Abraham needed saving just like we need saving today, church. He needed God just like we need God also. No, my beloved, Abraham was a human being. He was a man. He At one time, he was a boy. He was a husband. He was an uncle. He was a dad. He also learned obedience by the things in which he suffered. Amen. For I have learned the same thing. At times he stepped outside of the will of God. There was a time when there was a famine in the land and he went down to Egypt. But God never told Abraham to go down to Egypt. Abraham didn't seek God. He didn't seek for direction. He didn't pray about it. He just went on his own. He lived by the circumstance. He said, it's hot here. It's dry here. There's a famine here. I'm going through a hard time. Therefore family, come on. We're going to go to Egypt. But God never said for him to go down to Egypt. And there was a time amen, he left the altar. But he learned and he came back to God. He came back to that altar for God by his grace had spared Abraham and Sarah and his nephew Lot. There was a time that he got ahead of God. Anybody ever done that before? A time he got ahead of God. He had waited for for the promise uh, for 10 years uh, but still didn't have a son to carry on the seed. So Abraham and Sarah trying to figure this thing out. Trying to conjure up an idea. Trying to help God out. Anybody ever done that? Trying to do this. So instead of waiting on God, uh, they decided to help him. Uh, Abraham went into Sarah's handmaid, Hagar. She conceived and had a son by the name of Ishmael. The problem was, church, uh, they got ahead of God. Amen. Now listen to me. This is what happens to Day, and then we call it God. God didn't tell them to do it this way. Maybe most of the church at that time is saying, Oh, look, God has blessed them. And God is with them. And look how God had provided. Folks, we don't know the difference between what is God and what is of the flesh, what is of the spirit, and what is carnality. We don't know the difference. They got out of the will of God. They got out of God. They went their own way. They tried to handle this in their own thinking and knowledge and power and might. No, my friend. No, no. You cannot say that was a blessing. Amen. Amen. You see, Ishmael is a type of the flesh. Isaac is a type of the spirit. There wasn't any problem in the home until Isaac was born. Until the Spirit was there, until the Spirit was born, and all of a sudden there's all kind of quarreling in the house. The flesh persecutes the Spirit, even so it is today. The same thing. You have those in the church that are carnal. They'll rise up against those that are spiritual. Oh, you just think you're so spiritual. You just think you're so good. You just think you're... No, 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 no. Just trying to serve God. I'm just trying to tell you I make mistakes just like you make mistakes. I have to go through things like you go through things. I'm nothing special. You're nothing special in that sense. God is no respecter of people. I know that. But my friend, uh, a lot of people don't know the difference. And a lot of people are attacked today because they're just trying to follow God in the spirit. Sometimes we get ahead of God. Sometimes, you know, we think we need to to help God out. If God gives us a word or a promise and we don't see it come to pass when we think that it should, we just get ahead of God. But God didn't want Abraham and Sarah to get ahead of him. He just wanted them to trust him, trust him by faith. Proverbs 3, 5, 6, one of the favorite passages of the Bible for me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, with all your heart, with all your heart. Lean not on your own thinking. Lean not on your own intellect. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. But God is not asking for you to make sense of it. God is asking you to trust Him. Walk across the Red Sea. Walk across the Jordan River. March around the Jericho walls. Watch God stop the mouth of the lions. Watch God bring down the Goliath. God's asking you to trust Him. God's asking you to trust Him. 
Trust, 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 and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. It would be a total of 25 years, Greg, (laughs) before the promise would come, but it did come. 25 years, a long time. It came when God wanted it to come. It came in God's timing. Sarah was as good as dead. That's the Bible says. Sarah was past the age of childbearing. Come on now. Think about this. There's going to be no flesh in this. That's what God's saying. God waited for Sarah's womb to die. And God is waiting for you to die before He'll do something miraculously in your life. Because there's too much of self in the way, too much of flesh in the way, too much Ishmael in the way. And God is waiting for you to die, not physically, but to yourself. To crucify that flesh. Amen. Hallelujah. That's right. Sarah was past the age of childbearing. Man's not going to get the glory for this. There's no pill or no doctor that's going to get the glory in this. There's no hospital. I'm sorry. Nothing against it. I'm just going to tell you. Nobody's going to get the glory in this but God. Amen. But God. See, with God, the Bible says nothing is too difficult. With God, all things are possible. God says, I change not. Even when the natural man says it's impossible, God steps in. See, Isaac was a miracle child it was of god hallelujah they look back and testify remember when god did this remember when god did this remember when god did oh god was in that i couldn't have children i couldn't have any oh but god abraham wasn't perfect he made mistakes Oh, pastor, but he's the father of our faith. I know that. But he needed saving like you and I. He was a sinner. Moses was a sinner. I just touched the... Don't you say things like that. No, let me tell you. Moses needed God. We Abraham needed God. We all need him. When, when Aaron is the high priest would go into the Holy of Holies and offer a sacrifice on behalf of himself and then also for Israel, that also included Moses. Grace is in the Old Testament. It's all through it. Grace is in the New Testament. Abraham was not perfect, but secondly, he was a man of faith. God called Abraham, uh, uh, called out to Abraham to leave his family, leave his town, leave his country, leave his comforts, leave his old religion, leave your car. I want you to leave it all behind. Leave everything that was familiar to him and to follow God. And that's exactly what Abraham did. God gave him a promise and he held on to that promise. Look at Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 8. Go to the New Testament. By faith Abraham obeyed. Can you say the word obeyed? Abraham obeyed by what? By faith. Abraham obeyed by faith faith when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance and he went out not knowing where he was going he just trusted God Uh, I don't see it but I'm believing it Uh, he walked by faith not by sight God said that he had something for me so I'm walking it I'm believing it until I receive it can I get an amen the Bible says by faith he dwelt in the land of promise uh, as in a foreign country dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob uh, the heirs with him of the same promise for he waited for this city which has foundations uh, whose builder and maker is God and all the years uh, Abraham continued to believe God uh, for the promise Uh, he pitched that altar he pitched that tent uh, and when God said go he went he followed God Uh, he tried to, to, to do what God said to do To receive the promise of the Father, Abraham held to the word of God, regardless of how it felt, regardless of how it looked. He held, would hold on to the word of God, and he would walk by faith. His house was a tent. What he's saying is, I'm a sojourner. What Abraham was saying, don't get too attached to this world. You're not taking anything with you. You're not taking your house. You're not taking your vehicles. You're not taking your jewelry. You're not taking your your motorcycle. If I could, I would. 
I tell you, I, I really enjoy my motorcycle. I have, it used to be Sister Shelley's, and I love that. I've, I, I, I've wanted one of those for a long... I get people complimenting that thing all the time. Go in there and talk to that thing in the garage. I said, is there any way I can get you to heaven? No, there's no way I can get you there. I enjoy it, but it's not my idol. I enjoy it, but it's not my God. I don't live for it. I live for God. I live for the Lord. I live for Jesus. Amen. Isn't that right, Jason? We're going to live for God together, aren't we? Hallelujah. That's right. We live for Jesus. Amen. Listen, those things are nice to have, and I enjoy them, and it's therapy for me because I like to take the back country roads and just take it easy and enjoy. Let the breeze come through me and look around with no traffic. Oh, I just love the sunshine beating on my face, and the, the noise is too loud. I can't answer my phone, so I'm just out there with me and God having a wonderful time. Sometimes I put my wife on the back and she loves it too. Just enjoying the world, enjoying the nature, enjoying these things. And I, I thank God for it. But I'm not living for that. That is not my God. That is not my idol. He is my God. He is my Lord. I don't bow down to people. I don't bow down to things. I don't bow down to money. I bow down to God. I bow down to the Lord. There's a lot of preachers today that are compromising, compromising the Word of God. God, uh, compromising convictions uh, won't preach certain things because uh, they're afraid they're going to offend somebody. Let me tell you something, preacher. I don't know you. I'm not mad at you. I'm just trying to warn you. Do not bow down to the offering. Don't bow down to the tithe. Don't bow down to the almighty dollar. You bow down to God. You bow down to God. My God owns the cattle on a thousand hill. My God owns it all. Hallelujah. Too many preachers are preaching soft things. Bow down. Bow down to God. He, was a, he wasn't perfect. He was a man of faith, but thirdly, he's a man of worship. Genesis 12 and 7, Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your descendants I will give this land. And there he built an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. That's in our text this morning. Abraham would constantly build an altar and worship God. That altar stated that he needed God. It stated and he showed it his dependency upon the Lord. It was a place of brokenness, a place of prayer, a place of worship. Yes, Abraham was a man of worship. Abraham was even obedient to the point of his willingness to sacrifice his son to the Lord as a burnt offering. And when they came to a place that God wanted them, Abraham said to his servants, I will go yonder and worship. I will go yonder and worship. And then he said, and we will come back to you. Abraham was a man of worship. And not only was he a man of worship, but he worshiped with his son. Men, I cannot express to you how important that is that you worship. Why is it so hard for us to show our love for God? Why is it hard for us to express? I guess I'm expressive. I guess I didn't think I was until I I got saved. And he had so radically changed me that I became expressive. But when I got baptized in the Holy Ghost expressive you better believe it praising him loving him exalting him (laughs) hallelujah what's on the inside will flow on the outside Yes, amen. Abraham worshipped God with his son. I cannot express to you how important that is. Not just to worship, but to worship with your son. To worship with your daughter. To worship with your family. To worship with your children. Don't just tell them to worship, but let them see that you are a man of worship. You are a man that needs God. You are a man that leads in the way of righteousness and godliness. You are a man that humbles himself before the Lord and that will speak volumes to your family because children not only do they listen but more than listen they watch they watch I was sharing at the men's meeting the other night my dad used to smoke terribly and 
we lived in Mississippi, and so in Mississippi they do things a little bit different than California. And so my dad smoked, and I wasn't allowed to smoke. I was too young, but kids liked to dip. And so some, some kids at school gave me dip, tobacco. You put a pinch in your lip. They gave me what was called Copenhagen. Never heard of it in my life. Came a brown can. It's one of the strongest ones you can get. And that made me so sick and so dizzy. I said, I can't handle that. I said, there's something better than that. I said, well, the, the, you need to start off on something called happy days. Happy days. My, huh, huh. I got happy days and I, I got a dip of that snuff and I put it in there and I was with the guys. Man, I was cool. Put that dip in the back pocket, you know, makes the ring on that back pocket like everybody. I'm in with the group, man. This is good stuff. I'm in with the kids at school. This is all good. My dad was offshore working. He got home. He saw me, had that dip in my back pocket. He said, son, what is that? I pulled that out. I said, Dad, it's a can of snuff. It's dipping. I'm, everybody dips around here. He says, you're not dipping. I said, why can't I dip? I said, you smoke. He said, you're not dipping. Give it to me. And he took the can. I was mad. No ring in my back pocket. Not in with the group. Next thing you know, my dad is doing everything he can to stop smoking. And he worked and worked and worked and worked. And it was hard. And he would be angry and mad and grumpy sometimes. But finally, he did it. He kicked the habit. He quit smoking. Because he realized that he had a younger son that was watching him. And if you didn't want your son to dip, you got to quit smoking. If you didn't want your son to smoke, you got to quit smoking. If you don't want your son or daughter to cuss or swear or party or drink it up or dope it up, you need to quit all that nonsense. Quit it. You got children that are watching you. You got a, a son or daughter, younger children. They're, they're looking at you. They're watching you. And they're going to become what you are. And that's what we see in society, one generation after another. Broken, damaged, spiritual, deprived homes. The movies and the filth and the profanity and the dirt and the stink. And the poverty just gets passed down from one group of kids to the next group of kids. And then they grow up and they do the same thing. Broke and poverty and no spirituality and profanity and yelling and incest and sexual assault and pregnancies. Drugs and alcohol over and over and over. And that's why we're here trying to break the cycle, trying to reach those kids, trying to share with them and deposit something of God in them, trying to break the curse of sin, trying to break the generational curse of the family passing down from one generation to the next, trying to make a difference so that when those kids grow up, they can get married and live for God and raise their children up in the ways of God. That's what we're trying to do goodness gracious don't we see it that's why I'm here it's my heart number four Abraham and this is my last point. I got to quit. He put God before his kids. Mm, I'm, I'm going to hit this. I, I hit stuff like this years ago. And my goodness, I was the most wanted and hated man on the face of the earth. He put God before his kids. So many get this backwards today. I have seen too many times. When parents put their kids before God. I've seen it where parents make their kids into an idol. They ask their kids if they want to go to church. Do you want to go to church today, honey? What church do you want to go to today? You don't ask them if they want to go to church. You don't, you don't let them choose. You, they want to go to church. You lead them. You show them what it's all about. You, you help them understand about God and who He is and that He created the universe and the world. He created you and you've got purpose and we're going to go learn about the Lord. We're going to go worship and we're going to go pray. We're going to hear the Word of God. We're going to have fellowship. You, you lead them. 
You leave it up to kids, they're going to go to the popular church. It doesn't matter about the word of doctrine. It doesn't matter about what's being taught. It doesn't matter about the spirit. They're just going to go where the friends go because it becomes a, a community church, a socialized thing. I know because I was involved in that, but I wasn't saved. You lead them. Many times they let their children make the spiritual decisions in the home. We put whatever activity the kids are in before God and before worship. We are committed to our kids' sports and events more than we are of God. If they have a sports event on a Sunday, then worship's put on the back seat. Doesn't matter. That's what's happening today. Sports have become the golden calf these days. I remember when Matthew was playing baseball for River Valley, and we told the coach that on Wednesday nights and Sundays he has church. Do you know that the coach had more respect for Matthew and his loyalty to Royal Rangers and the house of worship? It spoke something to the coach. They saw his lifestyle. They saw his commitment. They saw his ser- how serious he was about baseball, about God, and he earned their respect. Abraham would have have to do the hardest thing in his life he would ever do. He would offer his own son Isaac as a burnt offering to God. Isaac was the son of promise. Abraham waited 25 years for the promise of God to be fulfilled. But Abraham would put God first. Get this. Now on some days when they're driving you crazy, you might say, yeah, I'm going to sacrifice you today. I know. Come on. I'm going to sacrifice you unto God. I have no problem doing it today. I understand that. Because I had those days too. A lot of them. Recently. <laughs> Let me tell you something, parents. Whether your kids are, are 5 or 10 or 15 or 19 or 24 or 35 you're still parents and they're still kids. Amen. Amen. You'll always be the mama, always be the papa. Always. Abraham would obey God. Do you know how hard this must be? If God gave me a promise and said, from this seed you're going to have many descendants. Look at the stars of the sky. And that's what you're, how many descendants you're going to have after you. To come through you, your lineage. And now he says, now I want you to take your only son, which you offer him up as a sacrifice. I'd be like, this doesn't make sense. I don't understand it. I hear you right, God. I don't get it. What are you trying to do? What are you trying to say? And so he was testing Abraham. And he didn't understand it all. He didn't know how it was all going to work out. But he believed God. Listen, I have proof that he believed God. Listen, this is, how, this is what Abraham did. He said, the Bible says, by faith Abraham offered up Isaac, concluding. Oh, this, mm. Do you have a concluding in your life? Can you say the word concluding? We need a concluding in our heart, in our life. He, it says concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. Wow. Wow. Even from the dead. Abraham put God first. And God blessed him. And said, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing I will bless you. See, God blessed Abraham when Abraham went through the ultimate test. Abraham put God before his children. He worshipped God. He served God. He was faithful to God. And this is what's needed today in the home. Don't stay home and say to your kids, you go to church. I, I got things to do. You bring them. Let them see that you worship. Let them see that you love God. Give us men that will rise up and put God first in their hearts and lives. And men who will love God, love their families, love their children, be loyal to God and loyal to their wife and loyal to their family. This is where it begins. This is where it starts. This is where it counts. Right here. I don't always agree with my kids. And my kids don't always agree with their daddy, but they do respect their dad. And what they don't want me to know, they don't tell me. But they don't know I know that they didn't tell me that I know. (laughs) 
Because I might not know details of everything, but they also know and realize that we have an omniscient God. And they have known and seen where God has put something in mom and daddy's heart many times that something wasn't right. Or we need to have a talk. I need you to come down, let's sit down for a minute, let's have a talk, or let's go out and have a cup of coffee. Is everything okay, Daddy? Sure. Everything's great. Just need to talk. <laughs> Their minds are gone. <laughs> but listen to me. I'm not perfect. They know they don't have a perfect dad. They know that. And there's a lot for a PK, by the way. They, they, people watch them. And they, they equate whatever they do to their dad. And, and so if they do something wrong, it's the dad's fault and so forth. I know that we go through all that. But, but those kids, and I got one on this side of the world, they do love me. And I do love them. And I'm trying my best, Mom and I, to raise them up in the Lord. And I pray that they will make right decisions. They're going to make mistakes. I know that. I've given them some grace. They're going to make mistakes. Don't pound on them every time they make a mistake. But when they do, they know they can come to mom and dad. And they can talk. Abraham wasn't perfect. But he sure was a one that we could follow as an example. This Father's Day, listen, dads are great. You dads are great. I know a lot of folks are out of town today. I realize that. They'll probably get the tape. That's good. CD, listen to it. That's wonderful. But I just want to say from my heart, you dads are great. Awesome. And you are so important. And you are so needed. I think that wives need to pray for their husbands. And I think kids need to pray for their dads. I think that the wives and the husbands should respect them. Dads don't demand respect. Earn it. Earn it. Earn it. On my bus, I've got another 110 adopted kids. 110 adopted kids. Very rarely do I raise my voice. But when I do, they know it's serious. But through the years, I've earned their respect. Now, maybe some of them don't like me. That's okay. But you earn their respect. And you earn it at home. You earn it in your family, your ministry, your church. Respect them, kids, adults, moms, dads, husbands, wives. Respect Your husband, love them, pray for them, be for them, because their job's not easy. It's not. I understand that. I understand that Satan targets them. I understand the struggle, the fight, the war against being passive. Moms, help your husbands. Help them to be the spiritual leader. God wants them to be. If you're a single parent, I want to encourage you. That's why we have this Bible study on Wednesday, Thursday, uh, the nights of the men, helping us to be able to understand what it is to be a spiritual leader, understand what God's purpose is in our lives, and then trying to fulfill that. So help them to try to fulfill God's purpose. Don't fight against them. Don't resist them. Help them. Okay? Dads, we need you. We need you. Amen? Can we stand here this morning, please? We need you. Praise God. I feel like this was just a very relevant message of today. Where we are. Thank God for the dads. Thank God for men. And I pray for them to be the leaders that God wants. Amen. Praise God. Can I just ask this right now as we close? To have all the guys, men, come on up here with me. Dads, men, 
Even if you're not a dad, it doesn't matter. Grandparents, men, would you come up here with me here right now? Would you come up here? Just stand right here and just just face me right here. Just stand right over here and just come on. Amen. Come on, right here. Just stand right here. Run around. Yeah, come on. We're not come on, all right. These guys are trying to live. Anybody else? Come on up here a little bit closer. A little bit closer so I can... Jason, come on up here. Come on up here. Yeah, that's a good job. Good job, Jason. Good guy. Yeah. These guys here are trying to make it. Other ones that are not here today, they're just trying their best to live for God. Some of them not married yet, but they will get married. And they'll have families. And they'll raise their children in the Lord. I pray they will. Some of them have children that have gotten older, like my children. Some of them have grandchildren, even grandchildren they're raising. That's an important job. I appreciate these guys. I'd like to ask the ladies to come on out. And, and if your husband's up here, stand behind your husband. I'd like you to come stand behind these men right here. These guys, come on. We need these men. This is a special day. It's Father's Day. Some of our dads have maybe passed away. They've gone on already. We miss them. We think about them. We think about our dads, the example they left for us, the legacy. Let's leave a legacy for the next generation. Let's leave a legacy for the next generation. Amen. Think about it. Leave a legacy for the next generation. Right here. We can make a difference. Praise God. Hallelujah. The Lord is good. Amen. I like it. John, just switch this over for me, please. Thank you. Praise God. Amen. I would like you just to lay hands on them right now and pray for them and bless them right now. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. Father, I thank you for these men that are up here right now. I thank you for the God-given call and the purpose in our lives. I thank you, God, that you love us, Father. Hallelujah. You see us, Father, right now. And I'm asking, Father, in the name of the Lord, that you would touch these men, bless them, help them, strengthen them to be the mighty men of God that you have called them to be. Hallelujah. The devil tries so hard to steal and to kill and to destroy. Pray right now in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. We pray in the name of Jesus. Oh, Lord God, have your hand upon them. God, one day they're going to have their own families and they're going to have a choice. A choice as to how they're going to live their lives. And I pray, God, that they'll live for the Lord. They'll do like Abraham. They'll try to follow God. They'll try to be obedient to the Word of the Lord. I pray in Jesus' name that there'll be men of prayer, men of God, men of worship. I pray, Father, right now, willing to sacrifice their all for the cause of Christ. Realizing that people are watching them and children are watching them. And they can make such an impact in these lives. You've called us, oh God. Help us, I pray, in that call. Have your hand upon us. Anoint us, I pray, Father, in Jesus' name. I pray the name of the Lord for your power. I pray for the healing power of Jesus Christ to heal my brother right now in the name of the Lord. Touch him, Father. Deliver him. Heal him, I pray, Father. I'm asking in the name of the Lord. Almighty God, I praise you right now. We love you, Father. Help us, God. So many things that try to tempt us, oh God. Help us, Lord, I pray. Just to live for you. To live for you. To be the man of God that will bring you glory. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you, Lord. We praise you, Lord. Now, God, I pray your blessing right now. I pray your blessing on the men of this church. The men that did not even make it today, wherever they are, I pray your blessing. Use them. Help us not to be passive, Lord, but proactive in our relationship. The world is a mess. It's on fire. 
Sin is everywhere. But it doesn't have to be our world. Lord, our world is with you. And we pray right now. Help them, Lord. We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless every one of you.